Hello everyone, welcome again to Modeling Methods in Mechanical Engineering and today we're going to culminate the first portion of the semester topics, uh, the portion of uh, field theory and uh, the different vector operators and integral theorems that uh, are part of this uh, uh, theory. And uh, we're going to do so by, um, by talking about very specific cases of implementation of these theorems or in uh, additional applications that can ensue from, uh, from the implementation of these theorems and um, and vector identities or or others. So let's uh, let's start um, modeling methods in EMI. And what we're going to talk about today is field theory applications so let's start with the with one that uh, that we actually started with uh, because when we when we introduced the concept of field theory we did so or I did so by uh, re referencing uh, gravitational fields which is a kind of a revolutionary concept in, in physics and mathematics because before then uh, gravity was just a force that acted between two massive bodies and it wasn't until Laplace came over and said well maybe because there's a field in between whose gradient happens to be that force and that gradient gives not only the magnitude of that force but also the direction this concept wasn't actually formalized so let's look at this from uh, from the standpoint of the different theorems and identities that we've expressed in this class so let's go back to um, so let's let's talk about these as uh, four fields, and we do so from the context of uh, recall Stokes theorem. which says that uh, the surface integral of the curl of a vector field and now we're going to call that vector field a force rather than a velocity so it's whatever force field and later we're going to make it the gravitational force field ds equals f dr so again assume that f is a force field Again, it can be anything. It can be the force field due to an electrical field. It can be the force field due to a gravitational field. There's anything that induces a force. And if you look at these, um, and let's look at these from the engineering point of view to see what it means, and uh, see this quantity here on the right-hand side of Stokes' theorem, FDR, and look at the units of this quantity and what it actually means by dotting two vectors. One is basically units of force, which is Newton, and the other one is units of distance. So Newton meters, as we know, is energy, but in this case, it's in the context of motion through a force. So this is joules, and this basically, this integral re here represents the path work. Or essentially the work done by a particle traversing a specific path C. All right. In this case, in the case of the Stokes theorem, this is a closed path, right? Closed path C. Because remember that Stokes theorem applies to an open surface whose bounding line is C, and that's a closed path that bounds the surface C. All right. Now, for the sake of argument here, let's assume also, let's assume for a moment that F is irrotational. Okay, that means that the curl of F is equal to zero. And if we want to be rigorous about this, we would say zero EX, zero EY, zero EZ. So zero in all directions. Okay. This also means, that means that then, hence, the force field F is conservative. 
Another way of saying that a force field is a rotational, or a vector field is a rotational, is saying that it's conservative. Okay. So, now, what does this mean? That means that if this is equal to zero, it implies that the integral of the, surf, the surface integral of the curl of F dotted into the normal vector to the surface S, dS, is equal to zero. And because of Stokes, this basically means that the work done along a closed path of F dR is equal to zero. And that all that is only if the field is conservative. Okay. So let's think of what this actually implies and what it means for a moment. We're saying that if we have a particle that is traversing a force field and it's traversing it in such a way that it returns to its own original position, then the total amount of work done on that particle or by that particle will be zero. So at some point during the, during the path, there's going to be work being done by the particle, and at some point during the path, there's going to be work to being done uh, on the particle, on and by, in a way that they will, they will, they will cancel, leading, leading to a network that is equal to zero. Okay. Well, that doesn't say much. It just says that it was there was no effort, right? On the so think of a planet traversing a, a gravitational field, which is a force field, and uh, and that uh, that planet doesn't have to actually do any work. There's no effort on that planet actually traversing that force field and returning to its original position. It just does so and 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 it, and it returns. But one implication of these. If we if we think about it in detail, is that let's say that uh, that uh, this is C. So this is a three-dimensional path C, right? And we have this particle um, that goes from again we have this force field, whatever it is, and whichever way it looks and then we have this particle here right that uh, let's say that this, it goes from position a right and let's say it goes to position B at some point right and then it returns back to position a and it's going to be doing so through a path called um, uh, I don't know uh, C1 on the way into B, and uh, on the way back from B to A is going to be doing so on a path C1 prime, right? So we say that the integral over C um, uh, of F dr, which is the total work, should be equal to the integral over C1 of F dr plus the integral over C1 prime. So here and then in here. And I'm going to make sure I include this uh, this arrow to denote that it's going in the direction of A of F dr. That means that a W should be equal to the integral from A to B of F dr plus the integral from B to A, F dr. Now, if we take this integral, the second integral, and invert the limits of integration, and that's, again, that's equal to zero. Remember that we are still operating under the assumption that this vector field F is conservative. So I'm going to write it here to make sure we don't forget that fact. So this is zero. So I'm going to invert these limits of integration. So the work, which is the integral from A to B, minus the work from A to B, should be equal to zero. And now let's assume that this is over path C1, and this is over path C1 prime prime. So the integral from A to B, F dr 
overpass, I didn't mean to include A to B again, I'm going to say overpass C1, this is this path, minus the integral over past C1 prime prime. And who is C1 prime prime? I'm going to say C1 prime prime is the reverse of the past C1. So it would be this one from A to B, but in the opposite direction. That's why I altered the limits of integration and included the minus sign. So the integral from A to B, so this would go from A to B on path C1, minus the integral from A to B over path C1 prime prime should be equal to zero. Okay? And notice that I arbitrarily selected what C1 was and what C1 prime prime is. So therefore, what on, this only says that the integral over any path going from A to B of F dr should be equal to the integral on any other path going from A to B of F dr. And the implication of these is that, that the work is path independent on conservative fields. The work is path independent on conservative fields. It doesn't matter what route you take, the work will always be the same from going to A to B. So the, the work from A to B has a value, it's not zero, right? The, close, the work on the closed path is equal to zero. If going from A to A is always equal to zero on any path on a conservative field. What I'm just saying here is that if you pick another point, right, and across this field, if I go from A to B in this direction, or I go from A to B in this opposite direction, or not opposite direction, for this alternate direction, I should get the same amount of work. So the work is path independent in conservative field. So, all right. Now, let's do a mathematical proof of these. We did a geometric proof. Let's do a little uh, math mathematical proof. So, now, if, let's just call it proof then, if, again, the field is conservative or rotational, then there exists a potential phi that can make up that force. We already talked about that, and that's because, this is because of identity that the curl of the gradient of any scalar should be equal to zero. Okay, you pick any scalar, you take its gradient, and then take the, the, the curl of that resulting vector field, and you'll get zero. So if a vector field that is given to you has zero curl, is it rotational or conservative, then there is a, a scalar such that it actually satisfies this relationship. Okay, so then this phi is the force potential. force scalar potential. Okay. So now recall two things. F is equal to some component in the x direction plus some component in the y direction plus some component z or fz in the z direction. And dr is equal to dx in the x direction plus dy in the y direction plus dz in the z direction. Right, so the term F dr would just be F x dx plus F y dy plus F z dz. Also, F, which is the gradient of phi, is such that F x is equal to the phi dx, F y is equal to the phi dy, and fz is equal to, oops, d phi dz. All right. So f dot dr, so don't forget that there's a dot here because these are two vectors. So we're talking about the scalar product is d phi dx 
times dx plus d phi dy times dy plus d phi dx, uh, I'm sorry, d phi dz times dc, right? So by chain rule, Remember, if we want to define the differential of phi, we apply, and phi depends on x, y, and z, then we have to take the partial of phi with respect to each of its independent variables, and then multiply times the differentials in those directions. And that's perfectly equivalent to this. So therefore, fdr is equal to d phi and therefore the integral from a to b of f dot dr is equal to the integral from a to b from any point a to any point b is the integral of d phi and this is as long as f is conservative which is simply phi evaluated at a and b which is phi b minus phi a. And as you can see, then this integral, which remember is the work, therefore the work is path independent. So really it doesn't matter how we go from a to b, all we need to do is evaluate its potential at b and its potential at a, subtract them, and then we get the work. That's all we need to do. So this is a very powerful um, expression and a conclusion of what would happen with the combination of knowing that a field is conservative or rotational and the application of Stokes theorem. All right, so let's look at an example. Gravitational force field. Well, we know that this is due to uh, Newton, and what, the way Newton expresses this is the force uh, between two massive objects was proportional to the two masses divided by the distance square between the two masses. Um, and then um, uh, the pro constant of proportionality is what we call the gravitational constant. But if we express this as, as in terms of a vector field, and we are the on the surface of Earth, then this would be zero in the x direction, zero in the y direction, minus mass times gravity in the z direction. Okay, this is a result of the application of the universal gravitational law. Okay, that results in that vector field on the surface of, air, uh, of Earth as long as the z-axis is actually points up. So this, is, this assumes that, again, this is the surface. This is what we call the datum, z equals zero. And uh, and then Z grows in this direction. And as you can see, gravity points down. So the force is actually pointing down in the Z direction. This this will be Y, this will be uh, X, and uh, and that's, that's what's happening. So the force of gravity basically points like this. All right, so if we calculate the curl of F, which is EX, EY, EZ, derivative with respect to X, derivative with respect to Y, derivative with respect to Z, zero, zero, minus MG, MG being a constant, you'll notice that you'll get zero. We don't need to augment this matrix to prove that this is equal to zero because all you'll be doing is taking derivatives of zero and a constant. So that's zero. So F, therefore F is conservative. And the work on the field, on this field, is path independent. Okay, so how do we get phi? Phi would be gotten by just expanding the expression that f is equal to the gradient of phi. 
and uh, which is equal to the phi dx in the x direction, which is equal to, I'm sorry, plus the phi dy in the y direction, plus dv dz in the z direction. And therefore, f, which has components 0, 0, and minus mg, should be equal to the phi uh, dx, should be equal to the phi dy, should be equal to the phi dz. Okay, so the three components of the force field. And this is basically equal to, so therefore, phi is, should be equal to the integral of zero with respect to x. Phi should be equal to the integral of zero with respect to x. And phi should be equal to the integral of minus mg with respect to z. This should be y. And therefore, phi should be equal to a constant of integral. The integral of 0 is a constant, which we'll call c1. And then uh, a couple of other functions, um, for example, a function of y, a function of z, which are constants of integration 2 in this integral. Then phi should be also equal to c2, according to this expression, because it's the integral of 0, plus a function um, 2 of x plus a function uh, g2 of z. And phi should be equal to um, phi should be equal to minus mg z plus a constant of integration c3. I should have actually given me more space. I've given myself more space here. F3 times uh, of x plus g3 of uh, y. So again, let's understand what I try to do here. If I integrate 0, and this is an integration with respect to x, both y and z functions are constant. So if I take the derivative of these with respect to x, I should get back 0, regardless of what that constant is, what that function is, and what that function is. I will get back 0 because there's no x's anywhere. If this is an integration with respect to y, and therefore phi should be equal to c2, plus f2 of x, g2 of z. That means that if I take the derivative of these with respect to y to invert this expression, I should get 0 because there's no y's anywhere in this expression. And likewise, if I take the derivative of these with respect to z, I get back minus mg, which is where I started. So essentially, the uh, gravitational potential of x, y, and z, and remember, phi has to be simultaneously the solution of this equation, Whatever function of y which would appear on the second or uh, on the second expression, whatever function of uh, x that is missing here will appear in the first expression. The only common commonality here is this function of z and function of z appear in the, th in the third expression. This is minus m g z plus a constant potentially. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to frame this and say I'm going to make that constant zero because it really doesn't matter, right? I'm going to make it zero because what happens is that, so this is the gravitational potential. As you can see, it has units of energy, right? Mass, acceleration of gravity, and basically the height or the elevation. So basically, if I wanted to calculate the work, between any two locations, any two elevations, A and B, uh, F, D, R, then this would be the integral from A to B of D phi, which is phi at point B minus phi at point A, which is minus mg elevation of B minus elevation of A. So the work done on a particle going from point A to point B at two different elevations is the mass times the gravity times the elevation of the two. And that's, as you can see, units of energy. All right, so that's the story behind the gravitational potential. All right, so now let's do an example where this isn't the case. But it's not necessarily the gravitational potential. I kind of squeezed that example into a single page.
Let me see if I can do the same for this one. That might be too much. Um, uh, well, let's try it. Um, so given given this force field, F is x squared in the x direction plus xy in the y direction. And if I take uh, the curl of F, um, I'm going to let you do it. So you just basically uh, take the curl, if you know the equation for the curl, the, form, the, the formula for the curl directly, or just take that determinant of that matrix and augment it. I can write it here. EX, EY, EZ, DDX, DDY, DDZ. And um, we have X squared, XY, and zero. And then augment it with the first column and the second column, DDX, DDY, X squared, XY. And because it's a two-dimensional vector, the curl will point only in the Z direction, and it would end up being Y of, e, of EZ. So if we have a two-dimensional vector on the plane XY, the curl will always point in the Z direction. The rotation is in the Z direction. Apply hand, hand, the right hand rule, and that's what it's going to what it's going to be. So this is this means that F is not conservative. It's not conservative because the curl is different than zero. Okay. So because F is not conservative, then because f of the curl of f is different than zero then phi does not exist we cannot find a phi whose gradient is equal to f okay even if we tried we won't be able to find it and we can go through the process of trying to integrate this and say for example d phi dx is equal to x squared, d phi dy should be equal to xy, and then therefore when I try to integrate this as a function of, uh, as an integral of x, then I'll get x cubed over 3 plus some function of y plus c1. And if I do it on this side, I'll get an integral of xy dy, which means that xy squared over 2 plus some function of x plus c2. Oh, I'm sorry. So this is... Oh. So this function right here, which is a combined function of x and y, should have been found also in here, because these two are simultaneous solution of the same equation. This function right here, g of x, is this one. And this function f of y is 0, right? But this function here should have appeared simultaneously on both. Any combined function of all variables, in this case, is a two-dimensional vector, so any combined function of x and y should appear anywhere. So even if you try to say, okay, I'm going to cheat and say phi should be equal to x, y squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 plus some constant, that's not going to work. That is not going to work because when you take the, the, the gradient of these, you get the derivative of these with respect to x, is um, y squared over 2 plus x squared in the x direction. And when you take the derivative of these with respect to y, you get, um, you get xy in the y direction. So, and this is obviously not the same as this. You didn't get the force, which is not equal to the force. So this is essentially not a scalar potential. It's not a force potential. All right. So now we have a force that is should not be path independent, and and if we want to calculate the uh, or a, a field in which work is not path independent. So let's say that we have the x y plane, and we have a particle here. And we have this force field. Again, I don't know how this force field looks like. We would have to draw it based on this equation here to see if it looks like this and the way to do it is you just pick points pick point zero zero and you'll get a vector that's zero zero right 
Pick point one one, and you get a vector that is one one. So it's a vector that's pointing up. Pick point one zero, and then you get a vector that's pointing to the uh, to the to the right actually. And pick point zero one, and you get a vector that's pointing to the right as well. So that, then you can actually build a map of these vectors, connect them together, and you get something like this. All right. The point is, let's say that we have a particle here at the origin, and then we want to go from point A, which is zero zero, to point B. Let's say here, which is point one one for the sake of argument. And then we want to do so on a straight line. So this is path one. And then we want to do so on a path like this, path two, which is not a straight line. Such that path one happens to be a straight line, so it's y equal x, right? And path two. Or like this happens to be let's say a parabola so this is y equals x squared so i'm going to try to integrate this force field over these two paths to see what amount of work do i get okay so if i go over path one the path where y is equal to x then the integral and let's just call this the work. Um, let's do this again. So I'm going to go over path one, where y is equal to x. Um, the work over path one is equal to the integral from a to b of f dr, which is equal to the integral from a to b of x squared dx plus xy dy, which is equal to the integral from a to b of x squared dx plus the integral from a to b of xy dy. All right. And, uh, and since y is equal to x, we know that then dy dx is equal to 1, and therefore dy is equal to dx. And then I can just break this up into work 1, being equal to the integral from zero from x equals zero to one of um, x squared dx. Um, that's easy to solve. And then the second integral, I can replace y with x, or I can replace, and then, then I can replace dy with dx. Um, plus the integral from zero to one of x times x. So this y is equal to x times dy, which is equal to dx, x equals 0 to x equal 1. So this is the integral of x squared over 2 plus the integral of x squared over 2, which is equal to 2x cubed over 3 evaluated between 0 and 1. So the work on path 1 is equal to 2 thirds joules, assuming that the force field units are in Newton and that the path is in meters, then it took 2, two thirds of a joule to go from A to B on the straight line. Okay. Now, if we elect this, if we elect to go over path two, then y is equal to x squared. That's a new path. In this case, then dy dx is equal to 2x. And therefore, dy is equal to 2x dx. Right? So when I take this integral over path two, which is also a integral from A to B, of f d dot dr, which is the integral from a to b of x squared dx plus xy dy, which is the integral from a to b of x squared dx plus the integral from a to b of xy dy, then the parameterization will be slightly different because y now is x squared and dy is 2x dx. So the work over path 2 is now... And again, we're going from the same point to the same point. So we're going from point A, which is x equals 0, to point B, which is x equals 1, of x squared dx plus the integral from x equals 0 to x equals 1 of x, x squared, to x dx. Right? And this will be equal now to x cubed over 3 
plus 2x to the 5 divided by 5, evaluated between 0 and 1. And then the work over path 2 will be equal to 11 15th, which is very different than 2 thirds. Um, 2 thirds is 10 15th, so, so it took a little bit more work, 1 15th more work, um, to go over path 2, which is this one, which is the parabolic path, than to go from on this path. And it took a different amount of work because it is path independent. So it is not path independent. So work through path one is different than the work through path two because F is not conservative. E phi does not exist in this case. All right. So that's that application in terms of force fields. Let's talk about a slightly different application now. And one that is not necessarily going to involve Stokes theorem, but it might involve parts of Gauss divergence theorem. In fact, in order to arrive at the proper equations, we would need Gauss divergence theorem. Application to fluid flow. So application to fluid flow. Let's assume that we have a, um, let's use the blue here. So we have a control volume, omega, that is surrounded by, oops, gamma, surface gamma, which happens to be the omega. So if omega is 3D, gamma is 2D. And then we have these, velocity field V traversing, maybe going through or escaping. And at some point here, we have this window that we call D gamma. And this window has these normal vector. Okay. So we apply first principle. First principle basically says that whatever amount of stuff goes in minus whatever amount of stuff goes out plus whatever amount of stuff is generated, and this is in rate form. So this is first principle in rate form. Should be equal to the amount of stuff that is stored as a function of time in the control volume, the change with respect to time in the control volume. So let's talk about, for example, mass, conservation of mass. So if we talk about the mass that goes in, in rate form, minus the mass that goes out in rate form, plus the mass that is generated equals to the amount of mass stored in the control volume. Okay. And let's just put numbers to this. Let's assume that there's a, that uh, this is equal to zero. So let's say that M generated is equal to zero because there's no, no nuclear reactions. That would be pretty much the only way that mass could be generated, right? Uh, if we have a nuclear reaction of some relativistic effects in which uh, mass can just show up out of nowhere. Um, so if that's the case, then uh, the amount of mass in minus out, remember that we express that as the integral over the contour gamma of rho v dot n d gamma. We've done it in the past. This is in minus out. This is mass in minus mass out. Right? 
because this is the velocity times the normal vector is the effective amount of velocity going through this window dotted into d gamma which is units of area so it's velocity times area is volumetric flow rate escaping this window positive when it leaves negative when it comes in that's why we put this negative sign in front because n minus out will be negative of and of the entire integral and we added the density because we want we don't want volumetric flow rate we want mass flow rate so this is mass over volume so it gets rid of the volumes on the on the numerator uh and puts in uh and and, and puts in mass and and the uh storage of mass will simply be the integral over the domain of uh, the rho dt the omega okay Remember that omega has units of volume, density has units of mass over volume, mass divided, mass over volume times volume is just mass over time. So this has units of mass over time. So let's recap here. This has units of mass, which is kilograms meter cube, that's density. Velocity is meters per second, and area is meter square. And this has units of the density, which is kilograms per meter cube, divided by units of time, which is second, times units of meter cube, which is the volume, right? So this ends up being uh, meter cubes divided by meter cubes. You end up with kilograms over second equals kilograms over second. So this is at least dimensionally consistent. So this is the units of mass flow rate. All right, so the equation that we have is that the integral of rho Vn d gamma is equal to the, this is the integral over the surface, close contour integral over the surface, is the integral over the volume of d rho dt over the volume. The integral over the surface equals to an integral over the volume. So if we use, using Gauss divergency theorem. If we use Gauss divergency theorem, we know that we can convert this integral into a volume integral. We leave the minus sign, and then this will be the integral over the volume of the divergency of this vector field, which happens to be now rho v. So let's assume that the vector field is rho v, not just rho the omega is equal to the integral over the volume of the rho dt the omega okay so we are applying the gauss divergence theorem over this particular integral right now in fluid mechanics language this is called reynolds transport theorem we are modifying a surface integral into now a volume integral it's just an implementation of gauss divergence theorem now we can put this into a single integral and this will be d rho dt minus the divergency of rho v, I'm sorry, plus the omega should be equal to zero. Okay, so we're getting somewhere. Now this looks like an integral equation, but now we have a single integral and that has to be zero. Now, since rho is different than zero, and rho is a positive number, I'm sorry, omega, the domain itself, then we end up with the fact that in order for this integral to be zero, the whole integrand must be zero. And this right here is just called the continuity, continuity, so con t nu e t equation and the continuity equation is the partial differential equation that governs conservation of mass in a fluid flow. Okay, that's what that equation is, and it's telling you
Now, if flow is incompressible, remember the density tends to be constant. I keep uh, not moving this appropriately. I apologize. So if the flow is incompressible, the density would be constant. So this equation right here basically means that this will go to zero and basically means that this density can be taken out of the divergency. So this means that the new equation just simply looks like the divergency of the velocity is equal to zero. And we've talked about this. The divergency of the velocity is equal to zero. It is the continuity equation or mass conservation equation for incompressible flows. So for incompressible fluid flows, the velocity field is divergency free, divergency free or solenoidal. Okay, and we've already reached that conclusion before by looking at the definition of divergency and we noted that when a field has zero divergency, it essentially means that two of the same thing, the same interpretation. Oops. Just make sure I can read this page. Right. I read. Okay. Now let's continue. Now let's say that for the sake of argument to continue this if flow field is irrotational, that means that the curl of V is equal to zero, then we have these two conditions. If the flow field is incompressible, We have the divergency is equal to zero, plus if the flow is irrotational, that means that the curl of V is also equal to zero. This is called ideal fluid flows. The combination of these two things. Now the first assumption is not a far-fetched assumption, it's something that could actually happen. Remember, flow fields can be incompressible if the fluid is an incompressible fl fluid, like a liquid, water, or if the fluid is a compressible fluid but is actually flowing very slowly or less than 30% of the speed of sound, it can always act as an incompressible flow. So this can happen very often. However, the condition of irrotationality is a lot more uncommon than that, and it implies physically that, again, the flow... Uh, particles are not rotating about their own axis when moving along a path line that basically implies deep down and this is something that uh, we can interpret physically that viscosity doesn't exist so the irrotationality condition basically implies physically physically implies inviscid flow so that the viscosity goes to zero. And that's never true. The viscosity of a fluid would never go to zero, even if a, flow, a fluid is very, has very, very low viscosity. Viscosity will always act. Viscosity will always act to, to actually glue flows to surfaces, to attach, to promote the, uh, the, uh, the no-slip condition. So flows cannot slip over surfaces. And now regardless of, that is regardless of how low the viscosity is, nonetheless, there's always a viscosity. So this is a far-fetched assumption, but it's a, it's a mathematical one that will make, for the sake of argument, to come up with some equations. Now, because, so to continue on this, because 
V is irrotational, then there is a velocity potential phi such that so there is there exists the velocity potential phi such that the velocity is the gradient of that potential only because it's irrotational and therefore the component u of the velocity field is the phi dx and the component v is the phi dy also that comes from the fact that the identity recall that the curl of the gradient of phi is always zero and therefore there is such a potential so that the gradient of that potential equals the velocity because the velocity is curl free it's only because of that that, that happens now if we use using the incompressibility condition that says that the divergency of V is equal to zero and V is now a gradient of a scalar phi this basically implies that the velocity potential satisfies the Laplace's equation so so Laplace equation for phi or velocity potential so that means that the velocity potential phi is harmonic velocity potential phi is harmonic now what are the implications of that well this is a very easy equation to solve it's a linear equation it's a partial differential equation x y and z but if we have appropriate boundary conditions then we can solve for it and if we solve for it then we can have the flow field so that hence we've solved the fluid dynamics problem without solving Navier-Stokes equation because Navier-Stokes equation doesn't exist in this case because we've assumed that the viscosity is equal to zero or this is a much more simplified version of the uh, Navier-Stokes equation all right so what's going on here Hmm. all right so now we know that these potential this velocity potential phi satisfies laplace equations and if we know how to solve the laplace equation which we do know and we have proper geometry defined geometry and boundary conditions then we can solve for phi and by sol solving for phi means that we solve for the velocity field because taking the gradient of phi gives us a velocity field so the problem is solved furthermore define a stream function stream function psi the stream function such that such that u is d psi dy and v is d psi negative of d psi dx remember so that the velocity field is u in the x direction and v in the y direction so if, if v is defined as uv in the x and y directions then we can define a stream function that satisfies this condition now if we use using incompressibility which means the divergence of v is equal to zero then we have du dx plus dv dy is equal to zero that means that d dx of d psi dy should plus 
d dy of minus d psi dx should be equal to zero. That means that the second derivative of psi with respect to xy minus the second derivative of psi with respect to xy or yx doesn't matter should be equal to zero. So that's okay. That's satisfied automatically. So the definition the definition of xi automatically satisfies or satisfies the incompressibility condition. So by defining it this way, we're automatically implying that the flow is incompressible. Now using the irrotationality condition, Again, remember that we're still talking about ideal fluid flow, so the flow is both incompressible and irrotational. That means that curl of V should be equal to zero. That means that basically the curl of V, which if the velocity is a two-dimensional field and we calculate the, the curl based on the um, based on the um, determinant of the augmented matrix or the matrix by which we calculate the determinant. This should go in the z direction only. So the curl of a two-dimensional field is always a uh, vector that points in the third dimension only, and it's dv dx minus du dy. Okay, so you can corroborate this by taking the determinant of that of that matrix, and that should be equal to zero according to these conditions. If that's the case, then we can take uh, dv dx and and replace v with the definition of the stream function so that is d dx of v which is minus d psi dx minus d dy of u which is d psi dy should be equal to zero so these terms should be equal to zero so that means that the second derivative of phi with respect to x squared plus the second derivative of, I'm sorry, psi with respect to y squared, and notice I multiply everything by minus 1, should be equal to 0. And that means that the Laplace of psi is also equal to 0. So the stream function, stream, stream function, psi is also harmonic. So it's, it satisfies Laplace equation, Laplace's equation. And if we know how to solve Laplace's equation, we have appropriate boundary conditions, then we can find psi. And if we know psi, then we know the velocity field, because all we have to do is take the derivative of psi with respect to y, we get u, and the derivative of psi with respect to x, the negative of that, we get v. So we are implicitly solving the flow field without having solved a complicated Navier-Stokes equation, just by solving a simple um, Laplace equation. So, to recap, let me do this. To recap, for ideal fluid flows, the divergency of V is equal to zero, and the curl of V is also equal to zero. So flows have to be incompressible and simultaneously irrotational. If that's the case, this leads to the following. The Laplace of phi is equal to zero, and the Laplace of xi is equal to zero. This is a potential function, potential function. This is a velocity potential, and this is a stream function. Recall 
that v is equal to u in the x direction plus v in the y direction and uh, u is the phi dx which is also equal to minus d psi dy well v is equal to the phi dy which is equal to minus d psi dx this is by definition what the potential is because uh, the gradient of phi is equal to the velocity this is by definition what the stream function is and as you can see there's a correlation between the stream function and the potential function and they happen to be perpendicular to each other so potential or equi potential lines v naught are always perpendicular to streamlines psi naught so if you were to plot them they're all going to be perpendicular to each other but again this is ideal fluid flows those whose where that satisfy the incompressibility condition, which is common in incompressible fluids and low speed flows, and the irrotationality conditions, which physically implies that the flow is inviscid, which is not physically correct, but at least it gives us a good starting point as to being able to solve for fluid flows, which is a, a very difficult problem. All right, let me go to one last application. This, uh, lecture on applications has been quite long um, but again this is the reach of these uh, field theory and uh, and engineering and sciences uh, of what we're uh, what's relevant to us as mechanical engineers and the last application I'm gonna make an application to electromagnetism and this does this is not or may not be too relevant to some of you because the, you might think that this is more relevant to electrical engineers uh, but um, this is the mechanism of heat transfer through radiation it's through electromagnetism too. so this actually applies to to heat transfer in the field of mechanical engineering so electromagnetism implies the following so it was well recognized even before Maxwell came up with the equations that I'm going to show you today that uh, there was some kind of relationship between an electric field so let's say that we have a, an electric field that moves in time we shake something that's electric so this is let's say on this plane on the bottom this is time and this is x y let's say so this is an electric field there's a relationship between that one and and a magnetic field let's say this is magnetic field h is on the uh, it's a vertical field they're perpendicular to each other but more importantly they try to drive each other if you move an, a, a charged particle, then you will create an electric field. By moving that electric field, you give rise to a magnetic field and vice versa. If you take a magnetic field and you rotate it or move it, you give rise to an electric field. So there's a relationship between the two, and Faraday explained this in many of his famous lectures. Field, Royal Society. Um, but it wasn't until Maxwell came along that he actually formalized this into mathematical equations. Okay, so if you define S as the cross product between the electric field and the magnetic field, call this the pointing vector. Remember that the cross product is a vector operator, so operation, so the cross product of two vectors will lead to another vector. Maxwell equations Maxwell's equations state the following he says that 
the electric field is divergency free, solenoidal, zero divergency. The magnetic field is also solenoidal. The curl of the electric field is equal to mu zero or minus mu zero times the time rate of change of dt. And that's why that's how one drives the other. As h changes as a function of time, it gives rise to the curl of E, which is basically a field that is perpendicular to it. And the curl of H is equal to E0, the change of E with respect to time, plus factor called sigma times the electric field. And all this stuff here means that there's no polarization in order for these conditions to apply. There cannot be polarization, no magnetism, and no charges. There's no electrostatics or, or magnetostatics. There's no residual charges or residual magnetic, magnetic charges. Mu zero is the magnetic permeability. Epsilon zero is the electric permeability and sigma is the resistivity okay so the resistivity of the conductor to which this electric field is traveling all right so maxwell formulated these four equations and then he realized the following if i take the curl of the fourth equation, this would be epsilon zero, d dt, the curl of E, plus the resistivity times the curl of E. Right? So I'm taking the curl of the third equation and I end up with the curl of the electric field. Now I'm going to use the identity. That says that the curl of the curl of a vector field A is equal to the gradient of the divergency of that vector field minus the Laplace of that vector field. Oops. Minus the Laplace of the vector field. So this is a simple identity that we can show that it works. So basically, this will lead to the gradient of the divergency of H minus the Laplace of H should be equal to, and then I'm going to replace the curl of E with minus the permeability, the magnetic permeability of the H dt. And I'm going to replace this with the same thing, sigma times the magnetic permeability dh dt. Okay. So this leads to, remember, because there's no mag the h, the magnetic field is divergency free, is solenoidal, then this basically I'm going to multiply everything times minus one, and this basically means that the Laplace of the magnetic field is equal to Epsilon zero mu zero times the second derivative of the magnetic field uh, with respect to time square times sigma mu zero times the first derivative of the magnetic field with respect to t. If we recognize recognize c equals to the square root of epsilon zero mu zero, where c is the speed of light is the speed of propagation of these electromagnetic field one affecting the other then the Laplace of H there's no dot in here it's just the Laplace of H is equal to C square times dH 
dt square plus sigma over epsilon zero times c square times dh dt. And this is what's called a damped wave equation. Damped wave equation. For the magnetic field for H, which is a function of X, Y, Z, and T. Now, if the resistivity is zero, right, like vacuum, for example, or like, I'm sorry, like a perfect conductor, then the equation would be just this. Again, this is the second derivative of h with respect to d squared. So this is a undamped wave equation for h. So we use the combination of these vector identities to actually fuse the four equations of Maxwell into a single equation for the uh, for the magnetic field, where it shows that it travels at a speed called c. So if you solve this equation, you'll get waves that travel at a speed c, right? And the speed c is essentially the speed of sound, or the speed of light. So it's the speed of electromagnetic waves, of electromagnetic radiation. So furthermore, if you do exactly the same, but do it with the other, with the third uh, Maxwell's equation. So similarly, you can apply the curl of the curl of the third equation, or the curl of the third equation, and that would lead to minus mu zero d dt of the curl of h. And again, this will be by the identity will be the gradient of the divergency of e minus the Laplace of e is equal to minus mu zero d dt of epsilon zero d e dt plus sigma e. And again, that will boil down to the Laplace because this one here is also zero, the electric field solenoidal. So the Laplace of e is equal to zero. I'm sorry, the Laplace of e is equal to, multiply everything times minus one, mu zero, epsilon zero, the second e, the t square, plus mu zero, sigma, the e, the t. So there's the damping term. But more importantly, this is also a wave equation for E, that we can recognize moves at exactly the same speed, which is the square root of mu zero E zero. So C is the square root of mu zero E zero, or I'm sorry, C is equal to mu zero times E zero, or the square root of mu zero times E zero, so this moves at C square. Uh, the second derivative of E, dt square, plus mu, oh, I'm sorry, sigma resistivity divided by the electric permeability times C square, um, d e d t. So this is the damped equation for e of x, y, z, and time. And also if sigma is equal to zero, that leads to the undamped equation. Again, it's a basic wave equation, which we'll learn how to solve. It's a partial difference, a linear partial differential equation, very simple. That basically means that the trajectory of E in time will always move at the speed C, okay? The square root of this factor right here. So this is the undamped wave equation. for 
And this was a major break breakthrough in science. It was the first time, well, not the first time, but it was a rigorous and formal way of actually unifying two fields, which were thought to be completely different phenomena, electricity and magnetism, after these were unified to show that there were just two manifestations of the same thing, right? So when you move with an electric charge, you create, you, when you move an electric field, you create a magnetic field. And when you move a magnetic field, you create electricity. The two are associated. They were associated before these equations were put together by, by experimentation, but not until Maxwell took these equations and actually figured this out. He, he, he basically showed that it's basically light. This is manifestation of an electromagnetic radiation field uh, that moves at a speed c square, at a speed c, that happens to be the product, the square root of the product of the um, uh, uh, magnetic permeability and the electric permeability, and that actually happens to give you the speed of light. Now, it was later shown by Einstein that these equations, because they don't show a frame of reference, the c, the velocity of speed or the velocity of electromagnetic radiation, has to be invariant with respect to any observer in the universe. Right? These equations don't basically basically show you that it doesn't matter where you stand, it doesn't matter where you show. If a flow field or if an electric field comes at you, it will always come at you at speed c, regardless of what speed you're moving or regardless of where you are. Okay, and then he used that for his time dilation um, hypothesis and so on and so forth. So this again is another application of this field theory that I wanted to show you, and I want to conclude the class today uh, with these and. Um, or uh, in next lecture, we're going to move into a completely different field, which is the field of um, curvatures. All right. So thank you for your attention, and I'll see you next time.